so now let me tell you a bit about what we do at the Dallas Forum. Our programming is almost entirely here in the Metroplex, and the goal of everything we do is to help people understand contemporary American public life in the light of timeless truths about human flourishing. Those truths have been handed down in what we academics refer to as the Western natural law tradition. They are truths derived from human nature and ultimately from nature's God. And we don't just want to study those truths academically. We want to figure out how they apply to the world we live in uh, and to how we should act in that world uh, as leaders or potential leaders in government, uh, in business, in the academy, in law, the professions, our neighborhoods, schools, churches, uh, or wherever our vocations may take us. And so the Dallas Forum's programming has a range from the more philosophical to the more practical. We sponsor a series of one credit courses at UD to introduce students to some of the classic sources and themes of the Western natural law tradition from Cicero through MLK and beyond. We bring in lecturers from across the country on all sorts of topics, always with the idea they should be saying something that's of interest to us as people who are trying to understand public life in the light of those timeless truths. In 2021, we had lectures on, among several other things, the future of the American Latino vote, the transgender movement in schools, the American founders' view of the natural law, and the state of conscience rights in healthcare, always from nationally recognized experts in these topics. Our lectures have no party line, uh, and in fact, we love to bring in people who can model respectful disagreement, both with each other and with us. Uh, I'm particularly proud of this one. In this October, we had a conference for North Texas students called What is Critical Race Theory? We had about 35 participants. I'd love to grow it for next year. We gave them a big old packet of readings, all original sources. They had breakout discussions led by UD faculty, and they heard lectures from five different North Texas college professors representing a wide range of views on critical race theory. One of our five was a straight up supporter of the movement. Three of them offered pushback against it to varying degrees, and the fifth was Chris Wolf. <laughs> that is not what most universities today mean when they say they're teaching critical race theory. Uh, but I think it was a great success and the students felt like they learned a lot. Another example, we're about to host in two weeks uh, the latest in our series of three-way conversations on hot button issues. We pick three public figures, left, right, and center. Although I do warn them when I invite them, center will not be defined by the national media. This is the center of Texas. Uh, this year the topic will be feminism and you can see more on the last page of our program. We've also started hosting an annual scholarly conference this April in honor of Chris's retirement. The topic will be uh, constitutional originalism. We've got top legal scholars from all over the country and keynotes from Judge Edith Jones and Judge Jim Ho of the Fifth Circuit. Uh, Allison Ho, I think, is here. Are you, are you, are you, there is Allison, thank you. Um, that's going to be co-sponsored by our friends at First Liberty Institute. Uh, and yes, lawyers, there will be CLE credit. So those of you who know us will have heard by now that the, this new name, the Dallas Forum, has not meant any fundamental change to the mission of the APPI. We're hoping that the new name will help us showcase to outsiders what we're up to uh, and therefore help us to do it better. We've just started the process of legally reincorporating under the new name. Uh, Luke Leckler uh, from Munch Hart, Kopf and Haar is very generously taking care of all that work for us. This is no, in no way to be construed as an endorsement. Uh, thank you, Luke. Uh, We've got a brand new website designed by our friends at On Fire Media. Jalen Wave, if you need a website, that guy designs websites, the great ones, dallasforum.org. Uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to put up more videos and more information on the website, and I'll update you on the mailing list when we do. Most of you are on our mailing list, or if you recently got an email directly from us, you're about to be added to our mailing list. Uh, if you got your information about this dinner forwarded only by your sponsor, we don't have your email address yet. We'd love to keep you in the loop about upcoming events like this. Uh, and we won't spam you. Please just go to dallasforum.org. It's the very first link uh, to subscribe to our, to our updates list. We're deeply grateful for the many ways in which the University of Dallas continues to support us, including by being a sponsor at this dinner, and we're honored to have President and Mrs. Sanford here tonight. Uh, I do want to make sure everyone knows the Dallas Forum is an independent 501c3. Our work every year relies entirely on the generous contributions of folks like you. Uh, if you'd like to talk with me more about what we do and how you could contribute to it, I'd of course be delighted to have that conversation. Let me give you now just one example of the type of project that I would like to be pursuing if we had the resources. We currently have a student fellows program. Uh, right now it's 33 of them, graduate and undergraduate. Many of them are here tonight in the crowded tables in the back. They're terrific. I would love to be able to better support these students and to give them a more intensive, formative experience to prepare them for life in the public square. And that's whether it's political or economic or civic or religious or what have you. 
Our undergraduate fellows are already landing some terrific internships. I'd like to help them find more. I'd like to fund those internships for those who can't afford to take a summer off, which was my own situation as a college student. I never did anything like this. I'd like to build up a, a network of local professionals who could be hiring these students in the summertime and after they graduate. I'd imagine some of you might be interested in that. Whatever you may have heard about what the 22-year-olds are like these days, I can promise you it's not true about those ones. It's not. Our graduate fellows are doing amazing academic work recovering the sources of the Western intellectual tradition. Uh, I did the same thing in grad school. I wrote my dissertation on St. Augustine. Nobody in grad school ever told me what you could do with a dissertation on St. Augustine. I feel pretty strongly about this. In 2019, I had, I had a year of leave from UD. We were living in Washington, D.C., and I spent six months working for Senator Mike Lee as Deputy Director of the Social Capital Project at the Joint Economic Committee, and then six months working at HHS as a Senior Policy Advisor in the Office for Civil Rights. These were incredible experiences. I had literally no idea in grad school that I was acquiring skills that would prepare me one day to be doing what turned out to be some fairly high-level policy work. I had to figure out all of that on my own eight years after grad school. I would love to help bridge that gap for our grad students, helping them develop the professional skills that will prepare them if they do stay in the academy to go on one day and found their own programs like the Dallas Forum. Uh, or at the same time, and at the same time, to prepare them for the many other great things outside the academy that a PhD really does make you good at, uh, because the academy now being what it is, they all know they have to be ready for anything. And so in short, I would love to be investing more in our student fellows, both graduate and undergraduate, because I do think that if renewal in our national culture will come from anywhere, it will be from students like this. But that's enough about the Dallas Forum. Again, I'm always happy to talk about it more with anybody, but let me now finally introduce our speaker. Kevin Roberts is now back briefly in the part of the country he belongs in before he heads back to his new home in the swamp. <clears throat> he originally came from a different kind of swamp. He must get tired of that joke. He's a Louisiana boy. He went to ULA in his hometown of Lafayette, where I'm not kidding, they have actual alligators in ponds in the middle of campus. It's terrifying if you ever go there. He got his master's in history from Virginia Tech while working as a museum administrator, and then came to UT Austin for his PhD in history, writing a dissertation entitled Slaves and Slavery in Louisiana, the Evolution of Atlantic World Identities, 1791 to 1831. That was when he and his wife, Michelle, had the first of their four kids, Emma, who's now a sophomore at UD. Emma, I don't know if you know this, you were on the acknowledgments page of your dad's dissertation. I, I quote the Kevin Roberts of 2003. Her entry into this world proved to be the right combination of distracting and inspiring. A story, a story that many young parents will recognize. After he finished his PhD, Kevin did the academic thing for a few years, and then he went back to Lafayette to found a new K-12 school called John Paul the Great Academy, which is still going strong. After that, he became president of Wyoming Catholic College, an incredible school for many reasons, only one of which is that it keeps hiring UD grads. And is run by one. And is run by one. Uh, as president, Kevin successfully took Wyoming Catholic off of federal funding to the envy of many of us. Uh, he then spent a few very successful years running the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which is where most of you have probably heard of him from, until he was tapped just a few months ago to be the new president of the Heritage Foundation, the single most prominent and influential conservative think tank in Washington, D.C. Everyone I knew in D.C., and that should not be taken as a measure of anything because I moved in very small and weird circles in D.C., but everyone I knew in D.C. was just thrilled that Heritage had made such an outstanding choice uh, in picking a leader with the intellectual depth and, and creativity, as well as the managerial skills, which they do not teach you in grad school, as well as an extraordinary talent in communicating complicated ideas to the general public, a leader that is with the qualities, with all the qualities that the president of Heritage needs to have in order to carry on and surpass that institution's outstanding legacy of service to our country. I am so glad that Heritage found him, and I'm especially glad that we could get him to fly back to Texas for the day. Please welcome Kevin Roberts. Uh, 
I have to say, even prior to that introduction, one of my best new friends in life over the last year is Dr. Dan Burns. And, and I mean that seriously. And so I think while, of course, Dr. Wolf deserves all of the credit he got from Dan, how about a round of applause for this wonderful man? <clears throat> You know, I'm from the South, which means that gratitude is at the top of my list. And so before I begin what will be a few hours of remarks, <laughs> this is about the future of conservatism. This is what you signed up for. Let me say, Bishop Burns, always great to be with you. One of my other newer friends, and I, and I say this with all sincerity, one of the two, the two, one of the two best college presidents in the world in addition to my other friend, Dr. Glenn Arbery, a University of Dallas alumnus, J.J. Sanford, thank you for being here. The, the two of you lead the two greatest Catholic institutions in the world. And as Glenn knows, and all of my friends in Lander, Wyoming know, and as the presence of our oldest, Emma, as a sophomore at the University of Dallas indicates, and I do mean this genuinely, so those of you who are development people at the University of Dallas, write this down. The University of Dallas is the single most important and significant institution of higher education in America. Period, full stop. <laughs> now, something to do with my comments tonight and thinking about my comments tonight let me mention three other groups of people as I was enjoying the reception, avoiding what I usually try to do, that is try not to have a few sips of bourbon before because you would get the kind of unadulterated Kevin Roberts. <clears throat> but I did do that tonight, so you know what you're in for. I saw a number of priests come in, and I pray for all of you men every day because not just of the sacramental gifts you give us, but because of your courage and your vocation. God bless you, and you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Second group, we have some folks from the Heritage Foundation here, colleagues, supporters, and thank you all for being here. You're great new friends. God bless you. And I have not just former colleagues from the Texas Public Policy Foundation, but such close friends who kind of surprised me tonight, which makes me choke up a little bit because we enjoyed six great years together. And those of you who are interested in keeping Texas, Texas, look at those guys in the back of the room. <clears throat> so with gratitude said, I'm here to speak the truth tonight about the future of conservatism. And look, I understand not everyone in this room wakes up each morning and says, I'm a conservative. Or even if you do, that I'm worried about the future of conservatism. But you need to be. And so it's my way of saying, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. It's the job that I've been asked to do tonight. It's the job that I've been asked to do, hopefully, for many decades. And if I do an okay job tonight, maybe I can do that for a few decades. But that's also a polite way of saying that I understand if this is not your jam. But you're here, and you're captive. <laughs> and I understand from Dr. Burns, you get to ask some questions. So that seems like fair game. So I'm going to walk us through my perspective, for what it's worth, about where conservatism is today. And I say that not as a partisan, which I'm not. Those of you who know me well know I'm not. I am, however, deeply passionate about a manner of thinking that changed my life. I'm deeply passionate about a manner of thinking that defines what it means to be American, even for our friends who don't call themselves conservative, and especially for our friends who are left of center. So in no way is this intended to be derisive, for sure, for those who are left of center. But what it is meant to be is an admonition for those of us who do call ourselves conservatives. And I mean that in the most 
apolitical of terms. I'll talk some politics just to ground the abstract. I'm a historian, not a philosopher, which means that I want to touch evidence in order to make a claim. That also means that I tend to be a little more precise, a little more candid than my philosopher friends. <clears throat> just, and he objects on the head of a pen, no doubt. No, all kidding aside, we need all the disciplines. I just thought that given the wonderful turnout tonight, which no doubt is to celebrate the great work of the Dallas Forum and Dr. Wolf and Dr. Burns, that that qualification was needed. Those who describe ourselves as conservatives have our work cut out for us. This is not true merely because of the policies of the current presidential administration, nor the increasingly radical stances of the modern American left. Nor is it true merely because of the state of American culture. What presents the greatest challenge to conservatives is conservatives. The conservative movement, no newsflash to you, is deeply splintered. That tends to be our historical default, but today the movement's fissures are especially deep. In fact, veritable chasms have emerged ever widening as political currents erode the bedrock on which generations of agreement, or at least of detente, have rested. It's now fashionable to carve out one's niche in the movement by verbally assailing other conservatives as some sort of dystopian competition of the American right. Consequently, American conservatism now totters on shifting sands. Many of its contemporary leading thinkers explicitly rejecting much of its intellectual foundation whether that be the history of classical liberalism or the significance of the American founding or even whether a pluralistic secular republic is even a heroic undertaking. That so much of this discourse occurs on Twitter aggravates these tensions. It also degrades the conversation and dare I say, those of us who participate in it. One might observe that the very manner of the online banter is decidedly unconservative. Too few of these exchanges in the Twitterverse appeal to first principles, clarify important claims, or acknowledge that the competing position might actually have some validity to it. How in the world can conservatives expect to influence future policy, let alone win future elections? The good news is that our movement has been fractured before. As I said, that's our historical default. The perhaps better news is that about once a generation, conservatives are able to coalesce just enough to win all the right elections in the same electoral cycle, giving them power, however briefly, to implement those very policies over which so much intellectual blood has been spent. In addition, there are already crucial gatherings where this kind of open dialogue is occurring. Since 2019, the National Conservatism Conferences have covered the widening fissures in the movement, admirably attempting to represent in the sessions and the speakers the wide range of opinions. Similarly, the January issue of New Criterion is devoted to a debate on what's called common good conservatism, where the same fissures are revealed, albeit some of them as rather deep divisions about which a few participants display a certain level of emotional attachment, shall I say, to their positions. And of course, the Heritage Foundation is right at the center, which is why I am here tonight, and which is why I have devoted the entirety of my leadership at that wonderful institution being engaged in this debate. Emotions run high in that forum, and on Twitter because so much is at stake. At least on that much, all stripes of conservatives can agree. And as we hash out our differences, sometimes collegially, sometimes less productively, what continues apace is the left's assault on truth, imposing a technocratic, elitist, nefarious regime, the very purpose of which is to undermine every last institution that stands between us and Leviathan. So yes, talk and debate, we shall. 
for our tradition as conservatives is to welcome discourse, recognizing that we subscribe not to an ideology per se and certainly not to a movement, but to the belief that in all our respective actions that build civil society, we can establish enough agreement on ideas and policy to influence the public square, including elections. Perhaps our event here tonight can play some small role in modeling both the type and substance of the discourse needed to cohere the conservative movement. Though it's trite, it's also true that the stakes for our country as a physical nation state, as a civil society, and as a set of ideals has never been higher. My objective, therefore, is to set the table for that conversation. In so doing, my ultimate aim, of which tonight's address is an initial step, is to facilitate a coalescence, dare I say a synthesis, around the key policy issues that will determine if we, or if Le Leviathan, will win. Moreover, I'll sketch a working list of principles around which I sense an emerging agreement, dare I say consensus, among conservatives. My hope, and trust me my prayer, has been that if I and therefore the Heritage Foundation can actively participate in these debates, acknowledging the new mo moment we're all in, as conservatives, as Americans, as free people, then whatever disagreements exist in the movement are just that. Differences of opinion, not reasons for the conversations to end. Lord knows, we need more conversations in this country. As the title of my talk suggests, I see community and the common good as central components of conservatism. Naturally and logically as a conservative, the practical specific circum circumstances of today don't change the fact that I see them as eternal parts of conservatism. Part of this understanding is that even as we engage very important policy debates, Disagreeing, that's fine, over where those particular issues rank in our priority list, that what doesn't change would be the principles that give us the very understanding of what it means to be conservative. And just a, a brief aside, although it's a key point, about my usage of the phrase common good. This is one of the many words, phrases, the American left has co-opted from our tradition. In fact, many of you as you read the title of my talk, or have now heard me mention the phrase common good a couple of times, say, God, he must be a social justice Jesuit. <laughs> Bishop, fathers, that ain't true. With all due respect to our Jesuit brothers, the point is, I meant that. The common good is a conservative principle, which subsumes all of the things we believe in, including the free market. The very reason the free market exists, the very reason free enterprise exists, the very reason we enjoy that in America is because of the common good. It is the beauty of the United States of America, which, in a nod to my friend Dr. Hansen, is a country that should always honor its founding, period, full stop. All of this implies the significance of culture. In my view, borrowing from generations of conservative thought, from Burke to Kirk to Robbie George to Ryan Anderson, culture is the very essence of what it means to be conservative because it emanates from our political behavior. It's self-originating in our homes, our neighborhoods, our communities, our cities, our schools, and yes, even in our national debates. To use today's parlance, politics is downstream from culture. The historian luminary Christopher Dawson summarized well the origins of culture. He said, culture, as its name denotes, is an artificial product. It's like a city that has been built up laboriously by the work of successive generations, not a jungle which has grown up spontaneously by the blind pressure of natural forces. It is the essence of culture that it is communicated and acquired. And although it is inherited by one generation from another, it is a social, not a biological inheritance, 
a tradition of learning, an accumulated capital of knowledge, and a community of folkways into which the individual has to be initiated. We ought to focus for a moment on Dawson's last word there, initiated. Consider how little initiation into our culture happens today. Or perhaps, if we were to adopt a broader definition of what culture is, to include the vacuous existence on social media, the malignant indoctrination of a generation of American school children by the education industrial complex, we might even be more worried. If, in fact, our folkways, to use Dawson's term, are now dictated by big tech oligarchs who exploit America's free market system, but who are decidedly hostile to America, and by self-appointed educrat elites who are also decidedly hostile to America, then what hope do we have to save our republic, let alone conservatism? The beginning of the answer, and trust me, I will become more optimistic, lies with a troubling but very helpful reality. At least the latter group, the educrats, are finally saying what they've always thought. They, not parents, are in charge of students. That reveals what they want us to know. They see the government-funded school system as the means by which their revolution can be perpetuated. But it also reveals a massively important point we must recognize, which is that this overreach is an opening for us to determine what the battle line is. And I'm sorry to use this noun, who the enemies are. To put a fine point on it, America will succeed if and only if we reject these elites and tear up root and branch the institutions that fuel their ransacking of our republic. And to put a second fine point on it, the future of conservatism lay in building a program, political, policy, cultural, social, educational, that rebuilds America from its institutional foundations. Anything short of that will merely prolong our agony. I state these observations as an optimist, I promise. The first step is to recognize you have a problem. And not merely as someone with supernatural optimism, alas, regardless of how bad things get in life, we're all striving to win in the end, that is the ultimate end. I make these observations as a conservative, through and through, with no adjective, no qualifier preceding the term. Because I see three forces that will soon converge, providing a once in a lifetime opening for our side. One, the healthy debate among conservatives will soon evolve into some semblance of agreement, hopefully with a heavy dose of an aspirational vision of how we return to self-governance. Two, the cracking of the new political order, a strange oligarchical amalgam of the radical left, big government, and big business, the latter of which may believe least in the ideals of America. And three, most promisingly, the organic emergence of regular Americans announcing they're fed up with the technocrats, the elites, the science, and all the ways those malcontents have exploited a virus to accelerate the imposition of their radicalism. But we have to seize the moment. That's what history tells us. As conservatives, we utterly miss the moment if we don't celebrate the convoy of freedom in Canada and its evolving American analog that, even though I'm now fighting DC traffic, hope snarls DC traffic very soon. <laughs> we miss the moment if we don't applaud the courage of my new friend, Dr. Mary Ann Jernson, a Virginia mom of four who respectfully but forcefully challenge the illogic of her local school elites. We miss the moment if we don't appreciate our collective victory over Leviathan last month when the Supreme Court struck down the current regime's vaccine mandate. I'm happy to say, happy to say for the first time in its 50-year history, the Heritage Foundation filed a lawsuit 
and it was on that case. And the reason we did was not at all to make a statement about what's called the vaccine. It was 100% about the absolute lack of authority the executive branch of the federal government has to have issued the mandate to begin with. And I'm so pleased to say we won. And look, <laughs> I'm as ready as all of you, I'm sure including the bishop and his priest brothers, to talk about something other than virus variants and lockdowns. But we must apprehend that the encouragement from our fellow Americans to do something against the elites and the technocrats is crystal clear. As my libertarian economist colleagues at Heritage say, Kevin, that would be a market signal. And they would be right. There is perhaps no better encapsulation of the inanity of our elites than Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's antics over the last week. In fact, there's no better encapsulation of the inanity of our elites than Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. <laughs> I say that as a son of Louisiana and French migrants 300 years ago, I find him very embarrassing. <laughs> Pressured, for example, to explain the unwarranted continuation of various COVID-related mandates, Trudeau remarked, and I quote him exactly, Mandates need to be followed so we can avoid further restrictions. <laughs> that would be an F in logic, sir. Look, I could, in fact, keep you here for three hours. Each of you could keep me here for three hours. You get the point. This is so traumatic to civil society, not just the overwrought shutdown surrounding the virus, but the, the, the issue that they speak to in a much larger sense, and that is the explicit desire, explicitly stated desire, of elites in so many circles to tell us how we need to live our lives. And I say that as a conservative. I say that as someone who understands that we all enter into civil society recognizing that there is a proper place for government. And even there's a proper place for government in helping us understand that the free market isn't the principle we're aiming for. It is a means by which we can experience flourishing. Witness, for example, and just indulge me for a moment with a little inside baseball talk, why the Heritage Foundation on Monday issued a, a white paper, this is just the first step of what we're doing, against big tech, arguing for antitrust action against them. We lament... We lament deeply, I lament deeply, that that's the best tool in the toolbox. And, and the fact that it's kind of the best tool in the toolbox among a few others suggests the work we have to do in rebuilding our institutions, including the regulatory state, a very small part of which can continue to exist in an ideal world. We look forward to the conversation that ensues, and I can tell you, I know this is being videoed, you can post it whenever you want, we don't have to review it, that those of you out there who are bothered by that, that just tells us we're right over target. And we're over target because big tech, I'll repeat for the 200th time, is the enemy of the people. And it's the end of the people not merely because of their taking advantage of our free market principles, which in the best of intentions, generations of liberals and conservatives have tried to perfect. It's not perfect, but they've tried to perfect. More so, it's the enemy of the people because what it does to us in our relationship to one another, not just as conservatives, but just for us as human persons. And it might be nice if one of the intended consequences of this action that Heritage is proposing would be to help to restore those relationships. So once again, even that comes back to culture. Roger Kimball, in the aforementioned wonderful issue of New Criterion last month, sort of summarized all of this really well. And so I'll quote one paragraph of his introduction, which is poignant. The real problem conservatives face, Kimball says, 
is not in formulating sophisticated principles, but in effectively confronting the juggernaut of progressive usurpation. For decades, we have been living with the one-way ratchet of liberal imposition. The harvest is a situation in which conservatives are considered legitimate only when they embrace progressive aims. Conservatives, in other words, have conspired in their own eclipse. Meanwhile, the true sources of value, not government but the family, the churches, and our educational institutions have twisted or been twisted out of all recognition. The answer to this tyranny lies not in the framing of better arguments, but in the deployment of a more efficacious politics. More effective politics means placing the right priorities on ideas who my mentor, former Senator Phil Graham says, would be when the time for a great idea has come. There are a few of those, I think. The first is in education. It is so plainly obvious as to be painful. And as I've told our, my heritage colleagues and others in DC, if we as conservatives, especially those of us who are in policy because of school choice, miss this moment, we probably need to go do something else. And yes, the fights on critical race theory are essential. So if you're engaged in them, continue. Not at all questioning that. But that isn't the end, right? You're, you're not engaged in that because that's the ultimate aim of your act activism in it. You're engaged in it because you understand it is the latest example in a generation or two of indoctrination. And hopefully it leads you to the next conclusion, which would be logical, which is that there must be something wrong with the structure of government-funded schools. And what's wrong, by the way, in case you're wondering what the answer to that question is, and there is only one right policy answer, I will tell you, it is that we don't have every dollar that is allocated to the noble traditions of American public education following every student so that parents can make the choice. And so, we're not going to fix critical race theory ultimately until we go upstream, if you will, and address the structural problem in public education. Therefore, it is the express objective of the Heritage Foundation under my leadership to continue something it's always done, and that's be very active in school choice movements at the state level. I can tell you that number one on our list and number two on our list, all the way down to number 10 on our list, is the state of Texas because of its six million school-age children. But even that's not enough. Until and unless we completely eliminate the US Department of Education, we're not gonna win. I'm not a popular guy in some circles inside the US Capitol for saying that. I was asked earlier this week by a right of center elected official, and of course I have to say in the custom of American politics, who's a good guy. <laughs> Might be. He will rename Nameless. Well, what is it that Heritage really wants to do, Kevin, with education? And I said, two things, sir. Give it back to the parents and get rid of the federal government. And once you do that, all is well. There's actually more to it than that because we now understand culture is such a big part of the problem. But for him, and by the way, he was receptive, it seemed, it was a good place to start. The second point of emphasis, before I get to some principles I think we might be able to agree on, has to be on federalism. Now, since I have left my days of doing work in the history of the slave trade and African-American culture, both of which were very fulfilling professionally, are really focused on not just the intellectual origins of American conservatism, but in particular, those of federalism. And one of the gaps that I see, and I say this respectfully for those of you who are participating in these wonderful debates about the future of cons conservatism, one of the gaps that I see among our friends who call themselves populist conservatives or national conservatives, or a gap that I discovered in my good friend Orrin Cass's thinking 
Orrin started the American Compass, probably likes the federal government more than I do. But Orrin, no kidding, is a good guy and very thoughtful. But the, a gap that I see is there's no place for the states. There must be a place for the states in conservatism. That is our root, not just in a political, structural sense of our Constitution. It is who we are. I could go completely academic on you and talk to you about how conservatism comes from this concept in late Middle Ages England known as country ideology where the elites who were focused in the centralized power center of London knew that if they really wanted a good answer to a problem, you had to talk to someone from the country. We might call that the flyover states. We wouldn't necessarily call it Dallas, but we might call it Texas. You get the point. And so I want to underscore this by saying I'm actually hopeful that even though that's a gap, I, I just, I want to give our friends, especially in the movement, the benefit of the doubt to recognize that amid all of the other challenges they're trying to conquer, perhaps they have forgotten that. And perhaps the role the Heritage Foundation can play as we rejuvenate our own activism in the states is to remind them that federalism is not just a last chapter in the book, it ought to be the introduction. So whether it's on education, whether it's on health care, or as the Attorney General of Arizona a few days ago reminds us, on the federal issue of immigration, states have a role to play. We fought the Civil War, we settled it. Those of us who are from the South and conservative and Christian are not talking about secession. We're talking about federalism, let's call it what it is. Third, it's crucial that we recognize that we have an external threat to this country that is the gravest threat other than relativism to America since the Soviet Union, and it's the Communist Chinese Party. There's not just disagreement, but pretty vehement disagreement on the right about that statement. I respect those who disagree, but respectfully would say that they're wrong. And they're wrong because of not just the human rights abuses, which are awful and can't even be spoken about after dinner. They're wrong because they are directly aimed at empowering a worse group of elites with worse intentions who don't just want to concentrate power in China among the hands of about 30 communist leaders, but want to do so so that by the middle part of this century, the American ideal is exterminated. And the fact that we didn't boycott the Olympics, the fact that NBC is even carrying them, are both abominations. <laughs> I happen to think in a good way because of providence, that if we can harness that understanding into productive conversations about policy that works, not at all in awful things that would happen to people of Chinese descent in the United States, but focus our anger at the Chinese Communist Party, that that could be a very clarifying moment for those of us on the right. It could clarify the context in which our differences of opinion on education, on industrial policy, on free trade, on big tech, become things we can talk about, but maybe more in an academic sense for some future time when we have defeated the Chinese Communist Party. You might imagine, given my comment, that we are very geared up at the Heritage Foundation for that. But let me make a caveat about it. There is a very legitimate criticism on the right about neoconservatism. And I say this as a recovering neocon. I know up to this point you thought I was perfect. <laughs> but I am. I used to be not just a subscriber to the Weekly Standard and loved the, what I thought then was a, the writings of a very smart conservative named Bill Kristol. I've changed my opinion on both. That America needed to be involved in every conflict to ex export Americanism. And I was wrong, like a lot of people. And I became 
knowledgeable about how wrong I was because I read church teaching, I listened, participated in debates with other conservatives who, much against all of their political self-interest, argued that those efforts were not right. One of them is a close friend of mine. He happens to work for the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He's a former congressman from Indiana because he stood up as the lone Republican against those efforts. His name is John Hosteller, and he's an American hero. It's a reminder that when you hear me, especially as the president of the Heritage Foundation with all of our wonderful foreign policy scholars, to know that none of us want to reprise what happened 15 and 20 and 25 years ago. What we want to recognize is that there was an earlier chapter in American history when we not just fought, but defeated the Soviet Union, but not really militarily, but through a concerted effort to revitalize American institutions, and yes, the American economy, but in concert with those institutions of civil society that work. So let me begin to wrap up here by mentioning something, two things I've not spent a lot of time on explicitly. The first is institutions. This is where I'm getting into some solutions. We're going to agree, I think, largely in terms of principles that we're skeptical of centralized power, that we need to focus on decentralization to some extent or another. We recognize, especially those of us who are Catholics, that subsidiarity is a guide, but the church never intended us to talk about subsidiarity without talking about solidarity. And so to reference my friend Oren Cass again, Oren's very right about the diagnosis he has of American labor. And as conservative Catholics, we ought to be able to work toward putting those in concert. This is what former President Trump put his finger on in his, his very unique way. But institutions, now is the time, tonight's the time, this moment is the time for each of us to decide with the time we have, the kind of emotional energy we have, the money we have, which institutions that are tottering get to fall into the sea and which we lean into. Yuval Levin has called this a time to build. Our friends Matt and Nate are doing this in some really innovative ways. Our friend Dan Burns sent me an article, which I skimmed today. He said, if it's a time to build, it's a time to build schools. So that's kind of where I end up going with this, although it is a time to build new media and new tech, as our friend Peter Rex is doing. The point is, stop wasting time and money on institutions that are working against us and find those institutions that not only are neutral, but more importantly, have a fighting chance to survive because they're going to take a stand for what we believe. And it's because so many of those exist, because of these new efforts represented in this room just with the people I know, that I'm optimistic. We're winning, guys. And I mean that not just in terms of the Virginia gubernatorial election. Elections are important and please participate in them, but they are not the end-all be-all. The end-all be-all is what we're doing far upstream from elections in building these institutions and have a very heart-to-heart -heart conversation as spouses, as families, as siblings, as friends about whether our time and our talent and our treasure should keep going to institutions, however important they once were in our formation, whether they should continue to exist. The second thing is, and this is often something missing in some of the debates among conservatives, and, and once again, I give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but I'm here to offer an observation about maybe one way we could improve that discourse, and that's the role of faith. There's very little wrong with the structure of our government, like the core structure set in motion by the Constitution. What's wrong, as de Tocqueville observed a couple of generations after our founding, if anything emerges as wrong, to paraphrase him, was us. Our virtue, civic virtue. He never, I think, could have imagined that we would stop going to church, that we would have each year, as Pew does, these studies of religiosity, fewer and fewer Americans who even belong to a religious affiliation. Politics is not going to fix that. 
University of Dallas will fix it. Some of the efforts represented here can fix that. But ultimately, you and I will fix that as evangelists to live out, especially the gospel commission. And so amid all of these very important policy debates, principle debates, we have to remember that ultimately this is a rejuvenation of society and of conservatism one soul at a time. So let me close by saying that ultimately this is a battle between us and the self-appointed elites who have put in place a despotism that just five years ago I would not have predicted. And I'll quote briefly de Tocqueville, who wrote that despotism, quote, ignores the body and goes straight for the soul. The master no longer says, you will think as I do or die. He says, you are free not to think as I do. You will retain your civic privileges, but they will be of no use to you. You will remain among men, but you will forfeit your rights to humanity. Go in peace. I will not take your life but the life I leave you is worse, worse than death. To all of you, I sincerely hope that none of us will have to die for our republic. But if we're not fighting for it, with the zeal that everything is on the line, our nation, our most effective institutions, our churches, our families, our lives, to say nothing of our freedoms, then we have already lost. I'm not willing to concede. I can tell you the Heritage Foundation is not willing to concede. For we see a distant hill, perhaps it's a mountain after a few mountains, where hindsight will, if we can get there, offer a sweet, sweet view of having conquered these struggles. God bless you. Dr. Roberts has graciously agreed to take questions. One of our graduate fellows, Miriam McIlvain, will be coming around uh, with a microphone unless you have exceptionally good, good lungs. It's a big room. Please just wait a few seconds for Miriam to get to you. Uh, and uh, the, the, the camera will stay up here. We do plan to post the video on our website. Uh, so the camera will not be po staring at you. If you, if you want to ask a question without being identified, that's fine. Uh, but it will be on the audio. Thank you, Kevin. I get to call on the very dashing and handsome gentleman there. Yes, sir. That's you. Thank you. My haircut's an experiment. I see you go to the same barber, That's Professor. Right. <laughs> I will keep them brief. I have them, three. plural. Do you have a pen? <laughs> Do you? Or are you have a good recollection? Right. Well, we're, we're about to test my memory. I know, you had some scotch earlier, too. <laughs> uh, I would ask about your opinion on subsidiarity mm -hmm. and how it plays across the board. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen an intrusion of from the top down right. on various aspects of state rights and of local rights as well, right. where the local people and their municipal government should understand how their town should be run or their city, how their school system should be run, and various other factors. So I'd like to get your opinion on that. Well, thanks for that question, and look forward to talking about your other sometime. You would probably think that I would talk about subsidiarity relative to all of the problems at the federal level, but I think you have probably a pretty clear sense of what I'd say about that, which is that we need more of it. I think what I want to focus on in the spirit of time is to talk about subsidiarity in its proper sense, which is at the local level. And that I want to encourage all of you, just looking around the room, knowing several of you, knowing about some efforts that exist in the greater Dallas area, multiple efforts, that while you might not be talking about subsidiarity explicitly, that's what they are, that's what is, is motivating them. And so across the board, start local, and that could include our friends at our particular parish or in some other Catholic organization 
who want to learn more about it, read more about it, and, and let's not present it in a skewed fashion. It really is meant to be working with solidarity. And that is where we could really talk about federal action. But I really want to encourage all of you, if you're jotting down takeaways that I'm implying, is to go take back your city councils, your school boards, your mayor's races. Those are nonpartisan, so that's a nonpartisan statement. Take them back in the spirit of self-governance and subsidiarity. Yes, sir. Mike's coming your way. I thought that our wonderful associate here wanted some extra steps today. Uh, thank you for all your remarks. Uh, my name is William. I'm also a recovering neocon. Um, so uh, to follow up the remarks on subsidiarity, um, what does tearing apart elitist organizations, root and branch, really look like? Mm -hmm. um, are you talking about the Irving CDC, the Irving... FDA, the Texas Department of Transportation. I mean, so what exactly are you talking about eliminating? And has there ever been an example where you're able to take that one-way ratchet backwards? Yeah, great question. So I want to say yes to all your examples, but <laughs> I think TxDOT does pretty good work half the time. So instead, what I'll do is put all sarcasm aside and say that when I was thinking about that, it, in preparing for tonight, I was really thinking about educational institutions, which might make sense given my background. Now, I do happen to think it extends to things like the CDC and the World Health Organization, but I didn't want to come across as just doing this talk to have a screed against shut lockdowns, although I would be very willing to do that in another forum. Instead, I want us to focus on the long term. And the institutions that govern the long term are all educational direct or indirect. And so to answer the spirit of your question, what does that look like? It means, and look guys, this is painful. We love our alma maters. But if your alma mater doesn't fit the criteria that I mean, you've laid out, you don't need me to lay out your beliefs, but what I laid out tonight, stop giving them money, organize alumni rebellions against them, do what I have done and others have done, and organize donors of very high net worth to build a national movement against them. And what might happen is that some of the institutions led by smarter people or with more astute boards will say, this is a real problem we got to change. That actually would be good because we've got a chance to reclaim them. But if what happens is our very dear alma maters close, guess what? That's what needs to happen. We need them out of the way, and we need our kids going to other institutions. So that's painful. It's long term. Your second, last part of your question about ratchets going the other way, sure. I mean, I'm a historian. I can give you hundreds of those examples in the United States history alone. Not all of them are violent. Not all of them involve bloodshed. But all of them require people in a forum like this to say, we've had enough. Thanks for your question. Let's see. Where's our microphone? Where do you want to walk next? Oh, let's see, all the way up here. We're gonna, right up here, first table. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, to your left, uncharacteristically. Yep, that's him, keep going. I know him from 35 years ago in high school debate, so he got- uh, that, That's right, so uh, thank you for the yep. uh, privilege. By the way, the best high school speech and debate competitor in the history of the state of Louisiana, Dr. Uh, Matthews. Uh, <laughs> you, are, you are far too kind. Uh, Kevin was also an outstanding speech and debate competitor in Louisiana high school speech, but regardless. So <laughs> my sense- I was trying to throw you off. This, see, this is what we're I know. doing. <laughs> he doesn't want to answer my question, That's so right. he tried to distract me. <laughs> it's a tactic. But, uh, so my sense is that today, the, the fundamental philosophical and intellectual division within the conservative movement is whether American conservatism is a champion and example of the Lockean liberal tradition. Yes. Or whether, in fact, American conservatism should be an alternative to and a repudiation of the Lockean liberal tradition. And yep. in the first camp, you know, you see people like David French, Jonah Goldberg, the Koch brothers, who want to see conservatism very much as the champion of, you know, free speech, constitutionalism, uh, the 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 best flowering of liberalism. On the other hand, you see people like 
Patrick Deneen and Saurabh Amari and others who want to see a kind of illiberal conservatism or a conservatism that challenges and rejects the Lockean liberal tradition. Mm -hmm. Is it your hope that the, conserva that the Heritage Foundation would take one side of this debate mm -hmm. and try to shape the conservative movement in one or the other direction? Or do you think that some kind of synthesis between these two seemingly incompatible mm -hmm. visions is possible? Well, thanks, Matt, for that question. There's a whole version of this talk that's just about that. But I decided that I really didn't want to name names because people would misread that. I mean, honestly. And, and I don't intend that. In fact, I intend the exact opposite, which is that whatever tiny role I can play in those conversations with writers who are far smarter than I will ever be is to, to try to move toward a synthesis. But philosophically, those are incompatible views. And therefore, the beauty of America is that for most of our country's history, we've been able to reconcile them temporarily for particular political programs, for particular high points in the conservative movement. And they're usually reconciled along the lines of some subsets of each of those traditions. And that is the natural law tradition versus natural rights and also putting in concert the common good in the free market, which I kind of did or attempted to do tonight. Having said that, it is the hope of the Heritage Foundation that we recognize that we live in a republic, not a Catholic integralist monarchy. And I say that respectfully of those, some at the University of Dallas who hold that position. It, they, it's great that they talk about that. It's great, but they're wrong. And one of the reasons they're wrong, no, I'm, I don't mean that to be ugly. Tell me I'm wrong. I'm not going to cry in my beer. Um, they're wrong in part because it's theologically wrong. And what I hope to bring as a faithful Catholic conservative to the debate is not to diminish their influence, but hopefully to show that there are elements of that particular sub-branch of those who want to reject liberalism, classical liberalism, that one of them is we need to have a very central role of faith in the public square. And as conservatives, more than anyone, we ought to honor that conversation and recognize maybe at the end of the day, we're starting within our movement at philosophically opposite poles, but for the purposes of not presuming God's will, of making civil society as good as we can in this life, that we can do it. We have never had a generation in modern America when conservatives have failed to do that. We might be living through one now. But the historian in me makes me optimistic about it. Thanks. And thanks for your own work on that. All right, ma'am, where do you want to go? Yep, I think there might have been someone. Nope. Okay, we're going to come way over here then, trying to save you some steps. Thank you. Yeah, there's a hand. Here we go, right up here at the front. Thank you for your patience. Hello. Uh, Hello. My name's Dave. I'm also recovering neocon. And there seem I, to be a lot of us nodding yeah. our heads. Yeah. Right. And I, I will say, on the one hand, Donald Trump did one good thing. He exposed the profound insincerity of Bill Kristol. On the other hand, we have how, if we're talking about the future of conservatism, and I apologize, I mean this with all respect, I feel we have to ask, how do we overcome the aspects of Trumpism that are morally, culturally, and intellectually toxic, if I may? I think that's a fair question. I don't think you have to apologize that for that, including those of us in the room, myself included, uh, who are very grateful for his policies. Leaders are very important to these social movements. And one of the reasons that conservatives are struggling with the question that Dr. Wilson asked is because we don't have a second term of Trump. That is not a political statement. It's not an endorsement. It's an observation from a historian. What would have happened in the second term of Trump, I think, would have been some of this reconciling because of some of the policy agendas, and I'm going to get to the heart of your question, some of these philosophical differences would have been resolved in policies that would have improved American life. I happen to believe that through and through. Room for disagreement, I admit that's fine. But to your point about personality and toxicity, especially on Twitter, um, they're an affront to what we believe. And we can look forward to a day 
when we have a leader, it could include him. We, we all can receive God's grace and improve, right? So it could include him. It could be someone else, not yet on the political scene, who can do both of those things, be very good personal witnesses to what we believe, as well as be just as ferocious on the policy side. That's what I'm praying for. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Kind of getting into the student section here, which means it's gonna be a really good question. Yeah, all the way in the back. You can see his fans pointing to him. They want him to ask that question. Thank you so much. You're um, welcome. Something I think is kind of missed maybe by both the French and Amarist uh, camps, but something that's really on my mind as a son of the formerly great state of California <laughs> and a happy recipient of the hospitality of the state of Texas is I'm in the in enviable, in enviable position of having to discuss with my parents uh, back in California whether or not they should leave. Hmm. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, a little bit I know about uh, Aristotle, is, you know, he, he makes fun of, of the size of Babylon, the fact that eventually you get so big, can you really govern? Can you really represent hundreds of millions of people as statesmen? So I, I wonder, is your vision for young people looking to build new institutions, is it one where the state of California is inhabitable, again, reasonably? And sure, of course, people have missionary impulses. This isn't a climate change. Um, and some question, of us have to, have to stay there, you know, it, it's important. But I genuinely think conservatism reminds us that there are limits to what, what we can achieve. So is, is, that, is that the vision, or, is, or should our energies be prioritized shoring up the states where we can actually accomplish the common good? Look, thank you. It's, a, it's all, all kidding aside. I'm trying to do a little bit of the after-dinner thing, which would be slightly humorous. But all kidding aside, your question is spot on in terms of the, the practical steps we need to take. And, and I honestly believe that one day California will be socially inhabitable again, but it's going to be, because I do. Uh, I do because we're going to, a, a growing number of people reaching into the millions now are going to place a priority on staking their claim elsewhere in the same way that the first Americans who settled California in the mid 19th century did exactly the same thing. And history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so what's going to happen is that, moving to Texas, moving to other places, that there will be an example, going back to federalism, that California will have to follow. Now, that's scenario one, which is kind of the best case scenario. Scenario two is that all of the idiotic policies of the state of California may actually cause it to fail. And they're banking on the federal government, that is to say, the full faith and credit that comes from all of us and our ancestors to bail them out. What happens when we can't? That kind of economic cataclysm is possible. How likely? Probably not all that likely, but it's also not a 0% chance. So I would encourage people, because your, your question is a serious one about advice you might give to family members and friends, to move out of California and participate in a civil society that's healthier, and then maybe in their lifetimes they can go back and participate when they've got a fighting chance in rebuilding California. You say on this side of the room, yes sir, Mike's coming around. Hello Dr. Roberts, Ryan Banger with the Alliance Defending Good Freedom. To, yes, and Good thank to, you for your work, Ryan. Good to see you again. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier there are some institutions that may be tottering and should be allowed to fall into the sea. And I'm thinking of uh, Joe Lonsdale, I live in Austin, Joe Lonsdale, Pano Canales, uh, launching University of Austin at Texas. And one of the rationales they gave was that our public institutions, public institutional higher education in particular, uh, are irredeemable. And I'm curious if you would categorize those institutions as potentially in the category of tottering and should be allowed to fall into the sea, yeah. or if they are redeemable. Ryan, is this your way of saying, Kevin, will you ever give up your addiction to Longhorn football? <laughs> the answer is no. And Emma would attest to that. But um, my alma mater is one that receives no money from me anymore. Yep, Hook'em. There's my favorite professional sports team. <laughs> That's on video, but they already know where I stand. <laughs> your, your question is excellent. Uh, yeah, they need, they need to go. They're irredeemable. And not only let them fail, kick them out. Look. You can disagree, that's fine, there's a lot of agreement. I'm just saying there is no amount of money, 
there's no amount of policy shift in the next 10 years that will redeem them if they don't want to do it. So hasten their demise so that we can celebrate the success of the University of Austin and replicate it a thousand times over in this country. Time for one, two more questions. I'm, maybe my Catholic integralist friend is saying, oh no, let's keep him up here. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Neil Osman, uh, represent the commercial world. Yes, sir, thanks for being I, here. Where I served years as CFO, et cetera. But, so nuts and bolts wise, uh, I really applaud the Heritage Foundation for filing suit. And I think white papers are very instructive and insightful. But are you going to branch into other channels? And I'm not looking for full employment for lawyers here, but uh, there's, there's, there, there's other ways that uh, we can reach out or an organization can. So I just want to- I really appreciate that question. And it's one that we often get at Heritage. And look, like I think most organizations, we can always do a better job. But the, probably the biggest surprise I had uh, at, when I took the Heritage job is how much of those other channels Heritage was in but that Heritage wasn't talking about. I don't know why. It certainly wasn't because we have incompetent people, quite the opposite. I think perhaps it's a result of having some success and having been party to a lot of success and, and just assuming that American society would always keep up with what Heritage was doing, which sounds arrogant, but I can assure you from having been there for two and a half months, it's not the case. The point is, I mentioned the white paper on big tech, and I was careful to say that's the first step. I know when you hear now a DC guy come in and talk about white papers, you're thinking, oh dear. But it is, as a C3, the first thing we have to do to talk publicly about an issue, lawyers would understand. But that is the first of what I hope is 500 steps, including legislative advocacy to the extent we can do as a C3. We also have a C4 arm. But I think, if I can presume, where you were really going with your question was what are you doing maybe with broader audiences outside DC, people of color, younger audiences. We have one of the largest, fastest growing media platforms in the country, The Daily Signal. It is a decidedly young audience. It's actually an audience that mirrors that of Jordan Peterson, overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly young. What are we doing with women? Well, they tend to come to some of our other channels. We don't have this perfected. I'm not telling you that. But I can tell you that we're working like heck to get there. And a lot, I think every other conservative organization I'm aware of is as well. So thank you, and keep the pressure on us to do it because we've, no offense to all of us who are lacking hair and of a certain age, we've got to add youth to our movement in order to win this rebellion. One more question. And so right there, sir. Yep, raise your, yep, you, right there. Mike's coming your way. Just wait for the mic if you don't mind. Thank you. And it's really not a question, it's more of an oh, observation. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm gonna get you off the hook. Um, but it's one of these comments that I think uh, people should recognize what the Catholic community does uh, yes. for uh, the betterment of this country. And it has to do with Obamacare, uh, when the, the abortifacides were a big thing. So my youngest son uh, went to uh, Belmont Abbey College outside Good. of Charlotte, North Carolina. They were the first institution to sue uh, the Obama administration for that. And then a fraternity brother of mine went to St. Mary's University in San Antonio. His law firm up in St. Louis was the first law firm to go after, uh, they're a Catholic law firm to go after the same issue. So I think we ought to be very proud about what the Catholic community does against the federal government when they're doing do these abominable things for us, and we should be very proud of that. This is my only comment. Look, thank you so much. A round of applause for the statement and for all of that work. I do this all night. Y'all are awesome. It's great to be back in Texas. Keep up the fight, and God bless you.